The learning outcomes of this course are, one, to be familiar with the, with the multiple aspects of project management, two, to be familiar with the, the ideas behind agile and structured project management and also concepts and techniques, three, be familiar with techniques for software estimation, which is a key part of project management, and finally, be familiar with the concepts and techniques for risk management. Which is the dealing with which is dealing with unknowns in software projects. Project management is actually m multiple things. The the one aspect of project management is planning, which is essentially f figuring out what future course of action to take from a set of alternatives. the The second aspect of project management is organizing is organization and organizing, which is managing individuals and their roles. Third is staffing, basically around hiring and retention. The fourth is leading, which is which you might think of as influencing people to contribute. In most large organizations, you know, non-military organizations, you cannot force people to contribute, so you have to influence them. Um, the next aspect of project management is controlling, which is the measurement and on and ongoing correction of activities in a project. Then there is the coordination, which is the relating together or the harmonizing of different individual efforts to achieve group goals and finally there is risk management which is the which is dealing with the unexpected and the unknown in a project now keep in mind that ma management is of course applicable to all professions um, but software engineering has some specialized requirements that we'll talk about next as we said in the previous slide um, software engineering has some um, so rather software project management has some um, special considerations. Um, so here they are. One is that in, in, in software development you, re, you, you rarely if ever repeat projects. So basically every project is a one-off which is a special kind of project. Therefore it's hard to apply the learning from previous projects directly into a new project. The second reason why, why project management for software projects is different is that the environment in which you operate, the organization in which you operate, the customers you have to deal with, uh, the things like that, and the team that you're working with are a greater cause of the comp of complexity and contribute more to the uh, aspects of project management than do technical characteristics of the system they're building. One of the reasons for this is also that integration and evolution issues predominate now in software development. That is, you're rarely building things from scratch. You're always building something that has to fit in a larger context. So what ends up happening is that the complexity of other ex existing systems contribute to the complexity of the system that you are building, the system under development. Let us look at some project management terms and artifacts. On this slide you will see various uh, project management entities and terms defined. Uh, on the subsequent slides you will see examples of each. On this slide, we show a project schedule on a chart that is known as a Gantt chart. A Gantt chart is a horizontal bar chart. The right-hand side of the Gantt chart illustrates the, the, the start and finish dates of what are known as terminal elements on the left. These are shown in light color in the diagram above and what are known as summary elements of a project shown in boldface. Terminal elements and summary elements essentially break down the tasks needed for the project. Most Gantt charts also show the dependency uh, between activities. Basically, they show the activities in, in what is known as a precedence network. Gantt charts can be used to show the current status of the schedule using percent complete shade, shadings as well, as well as a vertical today line that shows the status as of today. This, this today line is not shown in this picture. A work breakdown chart is a common artifact in project management. Here the task test motor has been broken down into four subtasks. Also shown on the same chart are estimated person hours, who is assigned to the task, what software tools are to be used, and the cost of the necessary materials and supplies, MNS. This slide shows activities in a project connected together in what is known as an activity graph. Here the edges represent activities. The edges are also labeled with time estimates for each activity. The time units are in days for this activity graph. Also, the nodes denote the ends of each activity. Note, 
the nodes denote the ends of each activity and are labeled with the activity number. Given this graph, or rather in this graph, activity 1.1 will take 3 days, while activity 1.2 will take 15. The graph is assumed to start on day 1. Thus, once the project has begun, activity 1.1 should be completed within 3 days, and activity 1.2 should be completed within 15 days. Activity 1.3 will be completed within 10 days after activity 1.2 is done. Also, dotted lines connecting two activities that mean that both should be completed before the project can move on further. You can see from this graph that because activity 1.1 only needs 3 days while activity 1.2 needs 12, activity 1.1 can wait while activity 1.2 needs 15 days activity 1.1 can wait 12 days and, and start really only on day 13 and still complete no later, later than its parallel activity 1.2. Thus, activity 1.1 is said to have a slack of 12 days. Also, both activities 1.1 and 1.2 can start as early as day 1, since neither has any dependencies. Activity 1.1, as said before, can also start as late as, late as day 13. Thus, day 13 is known as activity 1.1's latest start time. On the other hand, activity 1.2 has no slack and must start on day 1. Thus, day 1 is both its earliest start time and its latest start time. You should now be able to figure out the earliest start time, the latest start time, and the slack for every activity in the graph. See the next slide for these values. Note that only activities that can be done in parallel with other activities have a slack time. This slide shows the earliest start time, the latest start time, and the slack time for every activity in the graph. This chart is a typical chart used in Agile, um, used by an Agile team to track progress. It's called a burn down chart. Um, the the x axis are are dates, and the y axis are what are known as story points. Uh, completed. So the the blue line there shows how many um, story points are left over at the end of that particular uh, time period. So you know you started off with 64 story points at the end of some time period you ended up with 56 probably at the end of each iteration at the end of the next iteration you ended up with 48 at the end of the next iteration you ended up with 40 and so on and so forth. That's how your how you planned for your uh, story points to be implemented and your actuals actually are shown in red so you started off not with 64 but with 72 uh, story points uh, at the end of the first iteration you could only do two and a half so you ended up with 69 and a half then at, at some point you had a huge productivity improvement and then your actual sort of came closer to the plan and so on yeah so um, um, this is a uh, you know um, uh, uh, a typical chart using used in an agile methodology it's a you know it's meant to be put up on a on a wall so that it's highly visible high visibility being a big principle inside agile and it's basically used to to monitor a project this is a similar chart known as a burn up chart so rather than counting down from what you have in your uh, in your in in terms of requirements or stories to implement you are counting uh, up so the pink line there is the amount of stories you have to implement and the blue line there is the number of stories that you have implemented in at each iteration and you see that as you implement more and more and more stories your the blue line starts you know catches up with um, the, the the pink line and when the two meet the the project is considered over identifying the metric that you're you you're counting or measuring is an important step important thing to do when managing a project and the way to identify the the right metric is um, is done using a technique known as the gqm or goal question metric approach um, this this uh, a paper on this approach has been provided to you as a reading assignment but basically the the idea is this when identifying a metric, before identifying a metric, identify what goal you want to achieve by measuring what it is you want to measure. Okay, so for example, if the goal is predictability, if the goal is predictability, then 
what you want to measure is not size but variation so what you want to measure is not the actual value of something but how different the actual value um, is varying from um, the estimated value and that becomes your question so if the goal is productive it, it is predictability then the question becomes what is the variation between actual and estimate and then that defines your metric which is the difference between um, the actual value of something and the predicted value or estimated value of something. The next couple of slides show you how you can create an initial project plan. Now that you've seen the entities and the notations by which that you could use to create a project plan, that you could use to do your planning, the question now is what activities do you put on these uh, charts? What do you put on the project schedule? What might you create um, an activity breakdown for and so on? Well, uh, for a software project, you would begin by looking at the stages of a software proje project, which are the inception, elaboration, construction, and transition um, stages. If you're in inception stage, you would take the things that you have to do in that stage, such as uh, create an approximate vision, develop a high-level business case, uh, create some high-level estimates, and so on, and you would put them as steps in your project plan. Then you would create a section for the elaboration phase, and there you would uh, put in um, tasks for refining the vision, uh, defining the architecture, um, prototyping the difficult or risky elements of the architecture, and so on. And then in the construction phase, you would put uh, essentially uh, the features that you would release in each uh, uh, each 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 release uh, within that construction phase, and then within the transition phase or transi transition stage, you would put in things like beta test, customer handover, user acceptance test, uh, things like that. So this slide is basically showing how, in an agile methodology how the Agile methodology fits into the various um, stages of software development. You know, the inception stage, the elaboration stage, the construction stage, and the transi transition stage. Um, so you will see that that initial uh, grouping of stories into releases sort of is the inception phase. Um, then within the elaboration phase, um, the, import the important stories are implemented in iterations. You know, the iterations take place. At some point, um, the, uh, the all the risks get resolved within the project so then you enter the construction phase where you're simply adding features and then as the release uh, ends it's handed over to the customer and that's the transition phase now um, one uh, term that you you that we haven't introduced earlier um, is, is is the term known as a as a spike so a spike is a story added not by the customer but added by the development team because of a perceived risk that they that they see in the project. So, for example, let's say um, um, somebody in the development team says, "Hey, you know, you, you know what? Uh, I haven't figured out how how floating point calculation works in in C plus plus, and that that's an important uh, part of our system because we use floating point calculation uh, to do all our uh, actuarial analysis. You know, let's say that this is this is a application developed for the insurance business." So a technical spike would be added by a developer to, to go and investigate how floating how accurate floating point calculation is in C++. Note that a tech spike is not a story that came from a customer, so it has no business value. A tech spike is a story added by a developer in order to resolve a risk. Once you've identified the activities, you then have to estimate them. Basically, you have to figure out how long they might take, uh, how much they might cost, uh, how much these activities might cost and so on. So now let's look at a set of estimation techniques. Just for completeness, let's just note down why we estimate as opposed to, I guess, measuring. Uh, in a software project, the project doesn't exist, the system doesn't exist, the object doesn't exist, so therefore you have to estimate something that will be there in the future. Um, the other reasons for estimation uh, not not um, not necessarily in software project management, but just the you know the reasons for estimation 
is that the object that you are that you'd like to measure is inaccessible. So, for example, um, you might have to estimate the size of the moon because you can't reach it. And the third reason is that uh, direct measurement uh, is 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 too expensive or difficult. So, for example, um, if you wanted to measure the temperature at the core of the sun by sending a spaceship there. Um, going going into the the core of the sun and measuring temperature there might be too expensive or too difficult. Therefore, you've got to estimate it. Estimate it. So the 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 standard way of dealing with all these three issues is es essentially to identify proxies for the real um, metric that you want to measure. So you 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 measure something else that allows you to um, estimate the size of the thing that you really want to measure okay so that's the that's the goal in 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 all of this now keep in mind one thing about the nature of estimation in particular the nature of estimation in, in software projects the first thing is that the estimated amount in general increases over time it rarely reduces why might that be for example if you just took a, uh, uh, some, you were estimating something and it followed a, your estimation followed a standard normal probability probability distribution, you would think that you would estimate low as many, as much as you might estimate high, but in software projects that never ha never ha happens. You always when, you, when when you know as you as the project progresses and you get better at your estimation and we'll talk about why estimations get better over time. Um, the 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 size almost always grows, it rarely shrinks. Uh, here's why. The reason for uh, why the estimation always increases is actually software engineers and engineers in general are always are usually pretty good at estimating what they do know. So when they have to estimate a project, they might look at its components or they might look at um, its complexity and, and, and provide an estimation of what it might take, how long it might take, or what it might cost. Well, they're doing it based on what they think they know about the project at this given time. And if the project runs into any unknowns, which of course these engineers don't know at the start of the project, well, these will cause increases in time. They will not cause decreases in time because nothing that you think will be in a project ever goes away. You still have to do those. It's the new things that get added, added onto the project that, that add to the estimation, okay, or that add to the cost and, and, and duration. So, so always keep this in mind. You'll rarely run into a situation where your estimation reduces over time. You, you typically run into, you know, you almost always your estimation will increase over time. The next point about the nature of estimation, once again in software projects, is that the uncertainty in estimation reduces over time. And this is this is the reason for this is pretty obvious. You know, as you go through a project, you know more about it. Things that you were originally estimating because they didn't exist now exist, and now you can measure them, and you can use that to um, validate your prior estimations or, or um, use as the foundation for future estimations. So basically, over time, you start to know more, and therefore, the estimation uncertainty, the variation in the estimation, will reduce over time. Uh, we show an example of this uh, on the next slide. And finally, the greatest predictor of successful or correct estimation is having done that kind of project before. So for example, if you've done a, built a website before, then your estimations with respect to a, a, the, the next website that you want to develop will develop will be more accurate than if you haven't built a website before. Once again, the reason for this is pretty obvious. If you've done it before, you have a sense of what it might take, therefore your estimates are likely to be better. This picture illustrates what I said on the previous slide, which was um, the fact that the uncertainty in estimation reduces over time. And this picture is also known as the funnel curve for estimation or Barry Bain's cone of, esti you know, cone of estimation uncertainty. And the idea behind this picture is that as the pro project progresses from initial concept through approved product definition, through requirements complete, user interface design complete, detailed design complete, and finally software complete, the amount that the actual time it took or the actual cost or the actual estimate 
was different from what was the 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 you know the, the actual time that it took was different from the estimate of the time that it took that variability will reduce over time so at initial concept uh, you could be as low as uh, you know a quarter you, you, your estimate might be um, uh, uh, four times too low or four times too high and then obviously when the project finishes that uh, uncertainty in your estimation will go to zero because when the project finishes um, your actual time is is essentially your estimate okay but um, and and as you go through the various um, milestones in the project and your estimate will be more and more based on fact and therefore the variability in that estimate or rather the variability in the difference between the actual time or effort and the estimate um, that variability will continue to shrink so in order to do your estimation what can you use what param parameters do you use for your estimation well uh, you can use the the problem a description of the problem and any requirements that you might have of the software system you could use that for for the estimation so for example um, you could look at the problem that's being solved and think about whether the software system that is going to be built in order to solve that problem is simple or complex and if it is a complex software system then uh, in, you know in your imagination if it is a complex a software system um, you would you would add more time to your estimate Similarly, if you could see the list of use cases, you could you could go use case by use case and get a sense of what each you know implementing each use case might take, and you can add them all up, and um, use that use that for your estimation. So in those two uh, cases, um, we used a, a definition of the problem and the requirements of the system to do your estimation. Well, you can use a structure of you can use the structure of the solution as well to do your estimation. So for example. Once you have the architecture of the system defined, and we'll talk about architecture in, in later lectures, but for now, assume that architecture is the components that will be needed, uh, that the system will be composed of. Once you know that architecture, you can perhaps use that to do your estimation. So you could see how long each component might take to implement and, and use that and add them all up and use that as, as your estimation. You know, note the difference here. In the previous case, you were using a description of the problem and the requirements to do your estimation. Now you're using using um, the definition of the solution to do your estimation. And finally, in all of this, you might throw in some kind of quantification of uncertainty. So if you're early in the project, you might say, uh, you might add a, a, a pad of maybe uh, times two. Uh, later in the project, when you have the architecture defined, maybe you'll reduce that padding uh, from from two to one point five. Uh, that's sort of what we mean by a quantification of the uncertainty. Uh, next, what is the process of estimation? So, you can uh, here's how you typically go about it. You consider the steps that would you would take to produce the project. In other words, you'd con you would you would consider the software development lifecycle. Um, you would you would take a look at your project schedule and say these are all the steps I need to do um, and then you would estimate each step and you could add them all up um, while in, in your estimate of those steps you would consider the 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 capability of the resources so if you have an expert team uh, an expert requirements team that has done requirements analysis many times you might say that uh, you might reduce the estimate for the for a for a, a particular uh, step in the in the in the in the project which is the requirements collection step on the other hand if you have a team that has never collected requirements before you might increase the time needed for requirements collection uh, similarly if you have an expert architectural team you might reduce the time for doing the architecture um, if you have a team that's doing this kind of big system for the first time you would increase the time and so on so this is what we mean by consider consider the capability uh, of the resources available and of course you have to consider the cost of the resources available so uh, because you know part of estimation is effort and the second part of estimation is cost so you 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 you, you know estimate higher if the resources you are using uh, um, both personnel resources as well as you know computing resources like systems and so on were 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 more expensive um, the third thing you would consider in your estimation are constraints so um, where is the software being developed do you have a working environment with, with all the necessary for example connectivity and so on um, is the project an outsourced offshore project you know you you would factor these kinds of constraints um, into 
your estimation and then you might add some additional steps so you know there are steps that are directly contributing to the to the project basically like your your core value chain activities and there might be secondary activities that are not directly contributing to the development of the software so for example you might be doing some risk mitigation incidentally we will cover risk mitigation later but let's say you do certain things to reduce the risk in your project for example you train your software developers on on java because uh, this is a java project and none of them know java well that isn't a primary step that's a secondary step in your software development life cycle so make sure to you know to to count all those second secondary steps like training like risk mitigation into your estimation of the project so what is the problem with estimation in software projects the problem is that you're trying to do an estimate early in the game because you want to have a sense of uh, the budget, the cost, uh, you want to report that back to your customer, you want to have all your resources in place. You want to have all of those early in the game before you actually have anything. And that's the basic problem with with estimation. Uh, and things change. So what things change? The, the, you know, the features that might need to be added to a project may change. The people who you have on the project might change, some might leave, new people might come on board, uh, you know, things like that. Um, thirdly, any kind of measurement adds cost. So uh, if you go through a planning session to estimate and measure how much work you, you know, you, something might take, that in itself adds cost. And because software is complex, trying to get a sense of it in order to estimate it is going to add cost as well. The, the, um, the fourth thing is that software is intangible and invisible until actually finished. You know. Um, Requirements are imprecise. The notations are poor. Um, they don't capture requirements exactly. Uh, acceptability depends on the taste of a customer. So this, the customer may say, I need this feature, and you might think it's a simple feature, but the customer might, be a, uh, might, might really be thinking of it in a more complex way, and therefore um, the feature might actually cost more. Um, ne next, uh, individual productivity va va varies widely. So. Um, a study once showed that experienced programmers uh, are are six to ten times more productive than inexperienced programmers, and um, this variation in developer capability uh, is, is huge. And you cannot just by interviewing the people working on your project um, know whether they will be productive or or not. You just you know you, you only know once they have begun working and you have some familiarity with them. Um, the next reason is um, not enough time is spent in in estimating a, in, uh, estimating a software project or or in the planning of the software project. What typically happens is that um, the projects are under pressure to keep working, and thinking is considered a bottleneck, and uh, essentially not enough time is spent. Um, next, and this is a great illustration of why um, software estimation is difficult. You're saying software, a software project is like an iceberg. Uh, only a portion, a small portion of it is above the water and the larger portion of it is below the water and you're trying to estimate what's below by being able to see what's on top. Okay, so um, all you can see, for example, are the end user functions, you know, the use, ca you know, use cases and you're trying to estimate from there um, what all steps you might have to take with respect to the process, the development steps, the support steps, the installation steps, um, and all of those, uh, you know, those steps are going to, end, you know, result in maybe thousands or tens of thousands of lines of code. So, you know, ten end user functions might result in a hundred thousand lines of code. Um, the ten user functions are the tip of the iceberg, visible above the water, and the hundreds of thousands of lines of code are is the rest of the iceberg underneath. And you're trying to estimate the whole iceberg from what you can see above the water. Uh, and the last thing is that um, causality in a software project is often hard to figure out. So when there is a delay, you don't know why there is a delay um, uh, without expending a lot of effort to figure things out, uh, especially if you have a large team, one person may hold things up. You might, even not, you might not even know there is a delay until uh, a few days have passed, and then um, you know, tra you know, tracking back through everybody's memory and chasing things down and figuring out why a delay occurred uh, might be difficult. Um, you know, a bug might be complex to fix. A bug, you know, it, or or the bug might be simple to fix, and 
the people, the person assigned to fixing the bug simply did not have the knowledge to do so, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Essentially, finding the root cause uh, of the delay or the variation in productivity is difficult to find. Now, here's the second problem with estimation of software projects. The, 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 the problem is that when you find out about the true cost of something varies based on the stage at which you find it out. So, for example, if you find out that you need a new requirement and it's still in the requirement stage, all you need to do is add on another, add on another use case and you can throw that into your estimation. But if you find that you need a new requirement when you already, say for example, release the software, then not only do you have to add that requirement and build it, but then you have to, the cost of in including that requirement is much higher because there are already pieces of software built. If that new requirement changes things with respect to the architecture, uh, there's a lot of work to be done to break the architecture apart and, 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 and incorporate this new requirement. Um, you know, fit this in with all the, all, all the stuff that has gone in there. So, 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 basically, if your estimations are wrong, um, if your estimations don't include some element of the system or some element of the project early, the change in estimate, the change in effort or cost is huge if you discover that new problem or that new feature or that new issue later as opposed to earlier. Now, one thing to note is that in structured projects, rather projects that use structured methodologies, this this cost, there is a rapid climb of the cost per phase. So um, if you're doing, say, waterfall, um, then the, the, the change in the cost for including a new feature or fixing a new issue is, you know, climbs rapidly when you go out of the requirements phase into the subsequent phases and so on. Um, however, when you do um, iterative and incremental, the, the the rate at which the the cost increases even though that's a structured you know methodology the the rate at which that cost climbs depending on when you discover it is, is less and when you do agile simply because you're doing so many iterations um, and validating each requirement and so on as you go the 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 the, the rate there is a slower climb with respect to um, the cost of a change depending upon when you find it. Of course, it still doesn't mean that Agile is by definition better than structured projects, uh, simply because even though the, way, you know, the, the, the rate at which uh, the cost of a new feature increases, depending upon whether you do it in and figure it out in an early iteration or a later, later iteration or early release or later release, there are many, many more releases and iterations in Agile. So, um, you have many, you know, you have many more features allowed or discovered earlier. So um, even though the, the climb is not as high, you're doing many more releases and therefore the, the cost might still be high for incorporating all those features. So how do we address all these problems? Well, the first is a change in philosophy. So rather than measurement in order to predict the idea is that you measure in order to monitor, control, and recover, um, rather than trying to predict exactly how something might take, how long something might take. Okay. Um, the second um, way of dealing with these problems is to estimate in a disciplined manner. So don't just um, you know hold a wet finger up in the in in the air and in the wind and estimate based on based on that the power and direction of the wind. But estimate in a, dis, in, in, a, in a systematic, disciplined manner, um, you know, understand the requirements, uh, you know, choose the process, understand what work, work products you're going to create, uh, you know, break the problem down into smaller components and estimate based on that. Um, secondly, use a mix of techniques. So if you remember, uh, we, in, when, when we did the business case for the project with the, you know, high volume law firm, the technique we used to do the estimation was basically a resource-based technique. We assumed that, um, you know, there would be a, a, a team lead and, you know, say four developers to do this project for a year, and we estimated based on the cost of the developers. Well, that's one way. Now correlate that estimation with 
by, by listing all the use cases and estimating what it would take to implement use, each use case and compare that means, that, that method, that estimate with the, with the first estimate, you know, things like that. And thirdly, um, while, you know, as you do the estimation, record the assumptions under which you're doing those assumptions, those estimate, estimates. So, for example, if you're estimating based on resources, then record the assumptions you're making about the capability and quality and number of the resources. So, if any of that changes, you know you have to adjust your estimate. Yeah? And do and all and this is what is all that is done, um, you know, before the estimation is made. In fact, uh, at, you know, at the at the kickoff points for the project and for the various iterations and releases of the project. Now, during the execution of the project, during the iteration, during the release, during the you know, as the work is being done, collect the actual. So collect the actual time that is that is being spent. Collect the actual cost that is being expended. And, and use that to compare against your estimates and try to understand why there are differences. And then secondly, as you finish an iteration, take the actual numbers and use that in, uh, to calculate your, your overall cost. So at every, every iteration or every, you know, as you collect information, you're replacing estimates with actual numbers. Um, so, and, and so your, your um, final estimation, your, your you know, total estimation, is reducing in uncertainty because more and more of it is based on fact as opposed to estimate estimates. Um, other, other couple of things, you know, watch for violations in estimation in, in assumptions. We talked about that, and uh, watch for changes in key factors, either the process used or the requirements or um, the environment. All of those things, um, you know, watch for those. And then uh, after each uh, project, and in fact after each step in the project. Uh, collect the actuals, collect the, uh, you know, compare against estimates, analyze uh, why the estimates were different from the actuals, and then, um, very importantly, calibrate the estimations so that you can improve over time. So calibration means um, if you see one use case and you had estimated five hours of work, but your actual time was eight hours of work, when you now know that, that, that a use case of that complexity takes eight hours, so the next time you see another use case of that complexity, Estimate eight hours, not five. Yeah, this is known as calibration. So we talked about uh, estimating in a, in a variety of ways, and there are basically two basic types of estimation, uh, linear and pa parametric. So linear estimation simply means break the problem or the solution up into parts, estimate each part, and then add them all up. So for example, uh, a linear estimation um, for a, a project might simply take each use case, estimate the amount of time needed for each use case, and just add them all up and say, here's my estimate for the whole project. Um, the question, of course, in, in this is, uh, can you assume linearity? So do you simply add all the individual estimates up, or do you um, um, maybe add the first and second use cases up, but then the, when you do the third use case, you, you multiply it by a factor that sort of factors in the complexity of adding a third use case when the first two have already been implemented, you know, things like that. Uh, but anyway, all these techniques where the problem is broken up into its individual parts and then estimated, and, uh, and, and where the, then the individual parts are estimated and then the total is formed from, from that, the individual estimates, that's known as linear estimation. The second kind of estimation is parametric estimation, and the final estimate is a is a is a formula that is applied to various um, assumed or visible parameters of the thing that you're estimating. Um, so, for example, and and uh, in a software project, you might look at the parameters of of the product that you're building, or the process that you're using, um, or project parameters such as number of stakeholders and and um, um, the 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 quality and experience of the team and the schedule that you've been asked to work under and so on. So let's take the example of baking a cake. So a linear estimation would, would an example of, uh, of using linear estimation to estimate how long you might take to bake a cake would be to look at the recipe, estimate each step in the recipe, and uh, you know just add up uh, the, the effort for each step and uh, to get the total estimate for, the, the, for baking the cake. The parametric technique would involve um, 
estimate the complexity, you know, do your estimation based on the complexity of the cake. Is it a, is it a multi-layer cake? Does it have uh, complicated ingredients? Um, does it have, you know, complex uh, uh, components such as the icing? Uh, you know, uh, take those kinds of parameters and plug them into a, you know, some kind of a, a formula or function and estimate the effort of the cake um, based on that. So in your in your uh, handouts for this section, you will see a, a, a paper on use case points estimation. Um, that is an example of parametric estimation, and you're, you're actually going to be asked to use that in your in your project. Okay. So now the question, the, the, the final question is where do you get the data to do your estimation? So for example, if you're using linear estimation, how do you know what to estimate for each step? Or if you're doing parametric estimation, uh, assuming you're taking uh, um, various parameters, uh, converting them into numbers and then plugging them into a formula with coefficients and adding or multiplying them all together, where would you get these numbers? Where would you get the coefficients? Where, where would all those come from? And the, the best answer um, that the software engineering community has come up with, the software engineering research community has come up with, uh, after many, many years of research dating back to the, the late 60s and early 70s, is that you need to collect data about your organization, your team, your company, and use that to derive these coefficients. Okay? So historical data provides the value of these coefficients. Now, um, there is actually quite a bit of historical data available across, you know, for example, projects in the defense industry and so on. So there are some industry-wide um, um, benchmarks available for these kinds of numbers. And you can start there. But uh, organizations that have success in estimation um, typically over time collect data and use that to make their estimation process better and better and better. Here's how to do uh, the, the linear method of estimation. First, identify the element types you wish to count. That is, um, do you want to count use cases? Do you want to count modules? Do you want to count lines of code, etc.? Then estimate the counts. How many use cases will there be? How many modules will there be? How many lines of code will there be? Estimate what are known as production coefficients. That is, the person hours the team will expend to create one unit of the element that you are counting. <coughs> Then, through discussion, refine and validate these entries. <clears throat> Tabulate these numbers, you know, put them in a table, in a spreadsheet. Don't forget to include support activities and other consumables. So, for example, you could estimate support as some percentage of the overall development effort. Add any non-core activities. By non-core, we mean activities that are not spent in, in, in software development. For example, you might have activities that you have to mitigate risks, like training. <clears throat> Estimate the total effort by multiplying the element count that you've just figured out with the production coefficient that you've just estimated. Convert this effort to costs. So if it takes 20 person hours or 24 person hours and one person, uh, and you know, that's three days of work and you pay a person X amount for three days, you know, multiply the two together. Tabulate this also, document this also. Then in your in your in your final count document any assumptions and any reasoning used in this estimation pr process and finally when you've done this get an independent review this slide talks about all the elements that can be sized or counted so for example you can have software elements such as lines of code classes and methods you could have database elements such as tables and fields within these tables you can have document elements such as chapters paragraphs and pages you can have user training modules. That is, you could count how many users have to be trained and on what components of the software. You could count hardware components. You could count requirements. That is, use cases and stories. You could count test cases. You could also count process elements. So you could count the number, you know, the, estimate the number of iterations, the number of releases, the number of reviews. You could also create estimations of variability, such as mean, um, standard deviation with a confidence interval. You could use just you know low medium and high values rather than you know calculating certain values all of those things can be can be put into some kind of formula to calculate effort basically person hours and finally you can take these person hours and and multiply it by the labor rate and get cost and then you can get productivity 
uh, by taking the effort in person hours and dividing it by uh, the, the count of all the things that you counted. One estimation technique used a lot in industry, primarily in the, in the military, uh, military uh, industry complex. Uh, so companies that they do a lot of contract work for the government and for defense, uh, for, for the Army, Air Force, and the military, and so on. It's a technique known, known as the Delphi technique. Um, here, the, the assumption was that if you get a collection of experts, each with a different um, area, each with a different area of expertise, and you got them to estimate the, the size or the complexity of a problem, then even though the reason for the experts coming up with that opinion might not be clear, they would, in most cases, um, come up with accurate estimates. And if you allowed them to discuss their estimates with each other, they, their, their estimates would start to converge. And their converged estimate would be more accurate than if, than if they simply went to one kind of expert or if they used other techniques um, to, to estimate, uh, estimate something. So the technique sort of works like this. Uh, a, a question is posed to a room full of experts, maybe five or 10, each from a different area. Um, this is a done a lot in the military, for example. You know, how long will it take to achieve X, either a political or a military gain? And they get a collection of experts, maybe from the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy, maybe uh, from the CIA, maybe from, um, uh, you know, from uh, those res you know responsible for rebuilding, um, you know things you know people like that, get them in a room, pose the, pose the question to them, and they they sort of write down the answer, and then you know um, anonymously without any discussion, and then once their answers have been written down, they're they're put up on the wall, and then they're compared, and then the experts sort of discuss amongst themselves why there was variation in their estimates, why they came up with. Um, their estimates as opposed to uh, what, uh, you know, what, what others did to come up with their estimates. And through this process of discussion, the idea is that the estimates would converge and that this converged estimate was, uh, was, was you know, turned out to be uh, reasonably accurate. And finally, here's an estimation technique, which is a parametric estimation technique. And uh, this estimation technique is used, known as the UML, use case points approach. Uh, and this estimation technique is described in detail in one of the handouts provided to you electronically. So, you know, look at the zip file uh, for the, the resources for this project management module, and you will see a paper called use case points and estimation approach. And here the idea was that um, you took the assumption was that you knew the number of use cases, uh, you knew the use cases that were going to be implemented for the project. So you knew, knew the use cases, you knew, knew the actors, you also had some sense of the architecture, you had some sense of the skill levels and other environmental factors. Also, um, uh, you, you had some idea of the technical complexity of the, of the problem. And you put all of those into a formula and came up with um, an estimation for the process for for the for the system. Um, the you know so so what was done was actors, use cases, the architecture, the technical complexity, skill levels, all were given a number. Then they were given weights, and then they were just you know basically plugged into a formula to come up with the estimate. Um, in in your project, I'm asking you to do an estimate based on use case points. I'm also asking you to do an estimate based on linear. Uh, estimation and I'm asking you to do them independently so that you have you know two different people doing these two estimates and then seeing seeing how they compare um, now you might ask in this use case point of points approach where do the weights and coefficients come from and to answer that I point you back to some of you know to an earlier slide when I said all this comes from internally collected data so you collect data and you perform regression analysis to, uh, to figure out what these coefficients and uh, so on so on are So we will close this um, this agile versus structured uh, estimation um, with a slide on the, the differences between the two approaches. So keep in mind that the, the goals of estimation in agile are monitoring and management, 
rather than predict prediction and budgeting. Okay, so the whole idea is um, you work for a fixed period of time, you get a sense of what you can do there, and use that sense to estimate how much you can do in the next iteration, and so on and so on. And the idea is to get consistency rather than accuracy. So the units don't matter. The units don't have to be in hours, minutes, days, whatever. They are in some something known as story points. And the idea is you want to do a consistent number of sto story points in e each iteration. Um, you will also see, and once again, you will see this in the in the in the Fun with Legos or Agile Bootcamp game, that estimation is not done in in absolute terms, but in relative terms. So you're estimating. Um, which use cases are larger and which use cases are smaller or which requirements or stories are larger and smaller rather than exactly how long implementing a particular use case or story might take uh, and um, th this estimation is, is done in, in a relative manner as opposed to an absolute manner and the estimation is done in these sizes in these arbitrary units rather than in something uh, like uh, person hours or you know effort or anything like that uh, oh, and one more thing. Um, in, in most cases, these these sizes are not developer efforts, but in, the sizes are really uh, proxies for business value. So the idea is you're asking the development team, how much business value can you consistently deliver in each iteration? And you're using that quantity to sort of understand uh, how much value the project will deliver in each each iteration and therefore over time. The next module in this uh, section on project management is a module on what is known as risk management. Uh, risk management is a very, very important aspect of software development, and we will see uh, what risk management is, what techniques can be used to manage risk, et cetera, et cetera, in, 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 this, in this section uh, of this module. So this slide basically tries to describe or, or define what a risk is. So a risk is a possible future event that will lead to an undesirable outcome. It is a problem yet to occur. So it has not happened yet. It's not a problem yet. It is something that might occur. Okay. Um, incidentally, you might even have risks stated as requirements, which is, as, 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 as a non-functional requirement, you might have a requirement that says, um, this product shall achieve market acceptance. Um, that is not a feature of the product. It is really a risk of the project. Uh, so, and you might see, see it that way as well. Um, so a risk is a problem yet to occur. Okay? Risks become problems at what are known as risk transition points. And often there are transition indicators that will indicate that the risk is likely to become a problem. So for example, let's assume that the risk is, um, let's say you have a farm and you're, you're planting some crops and the risk is that you might have a thunderstorm that might blow the crops away. Okay, so the risk is the risk of a thunderstorm. The transition point is when the thunderstorm actually starts and the water and the rain starts falling and uh, you know, washing your, your, your crops away. And the transition indicator is the clouds forming over your land. Yeah? Hope that makes sense. So you can look at a transition indicator and realize that the risk is likely to become a problem in the near future or is going to become a problem in the near future. When it does become a problem, that's a risk transition point. And now that risk has become a, a problem. We said that risk management is the process of dealing with risk by quantifying uncertainty. So what do we mean by quantifying uncertainty? And we'll give you two ways by which, or, or two um, views of quantifying uncertainty in a software project. Okay, so this is a graph that is, that is known as a, as, a, um, as, as a risk curve. And the x-axis on that is time. And the y-axis on there is the relative probability that the project will complete on that particular date. So um, the idea is that the project will complete somewhere between January 1st and December 31st. And the, the, 
the graph basically shows the probability that it will it will complete on any of the of those two dates and the dates in between so january 1st is known as the estimated date so this is the date that when the project started and an estimation was created this was the date at which the project manager said this you know based on the estimation this is how long it would take and the point being made here is that the probability that it that the project will actually complete on the date that it was estimated to complete at the beginning of the project this probability is zero in other words there is no way that this project will complete on the date that it was estimated to complete okay and here's why if you remember back to the estimation slides we said that people are pretty good at estimating what they do know so if you think of a project and and and, and think of all the components that go into that to into implementing that project and then estimate each of them and add them up and so on and you come up with the date that date is likely to be correct assuming that when you actually do the project it's exactly those components um, that that go into the project what will typically happen is that that there will be unknowns that will creep into the project and therefore um, the estimation the the actual time for doing a project will always be greater always be greater than the estimated time so the date that the project will finish and the date that you estimated it would finish this probability is zero okay so let that date be jan first so as you progress further up, further away from january january first let's say february first and march first and april first and may first and so on you will see that the probability that the project will complete during those dates will will increase it will be more than jan first because you'll have more time okay and then as you stretch further and further out into the future the probability that the project will complete on a on a date say december 31st will become zero that is there is a hundred percent guarantee that the project will complete before december 31st which means that the probability that uh, the project will complete on december 31st is zero because um, there is a hundred percent certainty that the project will complete before then. Okay, hope you're understanding this. Basically, we are saying that if January first was, was the date that the project was estimated to complete, the probability that it will complete on that day is zero, right? And if you look further out into the future, at some point you'll reach a date by which the probability that the project will complete on that date will also be zero because enough time will have elapsed and the project would is certain to have completed. Okay, does that make sense? Hope that makes sense. Anyway, and the, and in between you have a graph that shows the probabilities in some short, so, sort of a shape that shows the the probability that um, the project will complete on that date um, somewhere between the the first date and the last date. So once again, what is risk management? We defined it as uh, dealing with risk by quantifying uncertainty and then dealing with that uncertainty, okay? So let's talk about all the various strategies for, for this last part, which is, you know, dealing with, with risk. Um, so the, the first question is when to assume risk. And the, the principle here is you only assume great risk if the rewards are equally great. In other words, you don't do a project that's highly risky where the deadlines are extremely tight and it's very unlikely that you'll ever meet them unless that project has incredible potential and can you know, deserve, you know, generate a lot of revenue or profit for the company. In other words, don't take on risky projects with no value. Okay? The risk that you take on must be offset by the value you're likely to create. Okay? Second thing is how to assume risk. So don't simply take on the risk and then worry about it. Yeah? Um, deal with it by presenting all commitments not as single points, you know, I will release the software by this date kind of thing, but as risk, but, but, as, but as risk diagrams or risk curves, say, um, I, I can release this, this project within this window, here are the probabilities, or if you give me a particular date, here are the features um, that I could have by this, I could have in, 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 the, in the software, uh, and here is the probability that, uh, you know, um, and here's the probability that these features will be there, okay? Um, second thing is define benefits to the same precision as costs. So for example, um, 
if your uh, customer asks you to quantify your costs down to the last dollar, he needs to present benefits quantified to the last dollar as well. If, he, if, if your customer can only quantify benefits in terms of ballpark figures, he should be okay with you being able to quantify costs in, ball, in ballpark figures as well. Okay? Um, make clear that goals are not the same as estimates. So, for example, if you you know if he asks you for a date and you you give the date of March fifteenth, make sure that your customer understands that March fifteenth is a goal, not an estimate of when things will be completed. So you're shooting for March fifteenth, but not you're not likely to to complete it on that date. Okay. Um, the 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 fourth thing is. Um, this is a complicated statement, you know, make sure closure metrics are defined before the first 15% of the project is completed. But it's actually uh, something very simple. It really means, you know, you know, people take on projects without really knowing what they're about or what it's going to entail or what the benefits are and so on, okay? That's all part of doing business. Okay? You don't know everything when you begin a project. You know, Columbus did not know that he was going to discover America when he set sail from uh, where he set sail from. Um, however, by the, the the rule of thumb is by the time the first fifteen percent of the project time is over, you must know what the problem is and how you're going to solve it. In other words, the elaboration phase of the project must be done by the time you've completed the first fifteen percent of the time allocated to the project. Okay, so that you have enough time to deal with any risks that can that that um, um, can can take place. Okay, so you have 85% of the budgeted time left to deal with any problems. Okay, in other words, there should be no assumptions, uncertainties um, about what the project is supposed to accomplish after 15% of the time has been, that has been allocated for the project is over. Okay, so this is just a rule of thumb, 15%. But the basic idea is know where you're going by the time you've done you've completed 15% of the journey. Okay. The third thing is you have different strategies for dealing with risk. The first strategy is risk evasion, okay? which simply means burying your head in the sand and assuming that the risk is not, you know, is not going to become a problem. Okay? This is not a strategy, obviously. This is just luck. The, the, the second strategy is what is known as avoidance, which is don't take the path that is risky. So for example, if a project is really, really risky, don't do the project. Or if a uh, you know uh, uh, using a language that nobody understands or nobody has experience with or you know using a uh, enterprise application framework like say .NET uh, when nobody knows how to use it is a risk then simply don't do that implement it using something you do know okay this is risk avoidance the third one is risk mitigation which is do things that will over time reduce the risk. So, for example, let's take the same um, the same uh, problem, which is you're asked to do the project using .NET, and it's a risk because nobody in your team uses has 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 any knowledge of .NET. Risk mitigation is, for example, training the people in .NET before taking on the project. Yeah, expending cost in in reducing the probability of the risk or the extent of the risk is known as risk mitigation. So for example, you could have two teams, one that does it in .NET and one that does it in J2EE um, with the idea that if the .NET project fails, then at least you have the J2EE one, okay? okay? The key thing about risk mitigation is the following. You're expending additional cost to reduce the likelihood or contain the damage due to any risk. Okay? I hope that makes sense. It isn't avoidance. You are taking on the project, but you're doing something more. You're expending additional costs to make sure that the risk is either less likely or if the risk does happen, there will be less uh, damage or less cost. Okay? The fourth strategy is what is known as risk containment. Okay? So for example, let's take the same issue about doing the project in .NET. Maybe you could do just the user interface por portion in .NET and do the rest of the project in, in Java or J2EE. Okay? That way, you've contained the damage of not knowing .NET, contained the damage of the risk of not knowing .NET to just the user interface portion um, of the system. So here's the process that companies follow as part of risk management. 
Okay, so this is a this is a standard process, part of best practices, and most mature companies will follow a process similar to this. So when a project starts, as they do their estimation, they will get the team together and do a have a brainstorming session that tries to brainstorm catastrophic outcomes, outcomes such as um, we are unable to complete a particular component in time um, because nobody knows .NET, or uh, a bug is reported in a particular component and nobody has the knowledge to fix it. Okay, keep in mind that these 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 what is being brainstormed here are not risks but catastrophic outcomes, the things that can go wrong with a project, okay, the events that can um, go wrong with a the project. Then the idea is to take these outcomes and then come up with scenarios where these outcomes might happen and identify the root causes of, of these, these outcomes. So for example, uh, take the situation where a bug is reported on a component and nobody knows how to fix it. The scenario you know, so you come up with a, a scenario for this and then identify the root cause, which is the person who wrote that component has left the company. Okay, so the risk is a personnel transition or a personnel um, or, or a person basically leaving the company. Okay, that is the risk. Okay, then find a transition indicator. So what might be a transition indicator for um, the person leaving the company. The transition, of course, is that the person leaves the company. What might be an indicator? The indicator might be the person is showing um, signs of discontent. Uh, the person is, you, you know, you see, you, you track the person's uh, web browsing and find he's visiting a lot of um, employment sites like monster.com or dice.com. Those are all the transition indicators that might indicate that that person is likely to leave. Or you know, or a person getting you know tons of recruit recruiting calls. Okay, um, so once you find that transition indicator, you know what to monitor. Okay, um, then you basically estimate the probability that that the the risk might uh, become a problem. You estimate the the impact of that problem. Um, you estimate how much budget you might need um, to deal with that problem. Uh, how much uh, additional time you need to deal with that problem. And whenever you run into a situation where you have unknowns, you, you, know, you and your team basically will brainstorm, what could I know, okay, what could I know that I don't know now that will help me bound this problem? Okay, so once again, take the situation of the personal person leaving. Um, you might initially just throw up your hands and say, I don't know when he's going to leave. And then you could start thinking about how you might find out that the person is likely to leave and you might realize that his uh, web browsing activity, monitoring his web browsing activity and whether he looks up monster and dice and so on might be a way of re uh, figuring out whether that person is going to leave. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that, you know, b basically when you run into an unknown, you try to think through what is it that you might have known that if you knew it, it would help you address that unknown. Then you describe your management actions, which is how are you going to deal with it. So coming to the situation of a of, of, of personal turnover, or some, you know somebody leaving, your management action might be um, don't put that person on the project team if you know that that person is likely to leave, or else uh, train and understudy. So you know whatever this person does, you have somebody working with 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 him or her, so that uh, even if uh, either, you know one of them leaves, the other one is ready to take over. You know things like that. Um, the, 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 the next one is, is an interesting one, which is risk assignment, which is, um, and, and the best, you know, a good example of, of why you might do risk assignment is uh, an example like this, this, this product or this software application must get market acceptance. The development team could look at that risk, which is the risk of market acceptance and say, this is not our problem. This is a problem of the marketing department or the, or the, the, organization that is commissioning this product, not us. Okay? Essentially, they have taken the risk and assigned it to somebody else, you know, presumably higher up in the food chain, um, who can deal with that risk so, um, because it is not appropriate for that risk to be dealt with at your level. Okay? Um, and the other thing is that there are certain risks that you can't mitigate. You know. Um, a lightning strike or um, or nuclear war 
that you can't mitigate. These simply are, you know, these are showstoppers. Okay, you know, the company goes out of business. Okay, you know, things like that. These are showstoppers. There's nothing you can do about them. Okay, um, ra in, in, for for such things, you don't try to do risk management because there's nothing you can do. Instead, you simply document that as th those as assumptions. Okay, this project will succeed if the company stays in business. Things like that. Okay. Once you've done uh, risk assignments, you add this you add this risk to the risk repository. Basically, you've brainstormed a risk. You decided that this risk was new, and you add it to a database of risks. Okay. Uh, and, and incidentally, this database doesn't start with an empty data. You don't start with an empty database at the beginning of each project. You look at the previous projects that have taken place. You, you, you see what risks occurred with, you know, which, what risks were considered and or became problems in, in those projects. And you populate your risk repository or risk database with all, the, all, the, all those risks. Okay? And incidentally, if you discover a new risk, you populate that database with it. So you have a, a, a database or a, you know, a library of risks that you can then you know take to uh, uh, you know that you can then uh, analyze at the start of every project and say is this project likely to encounter any of these risks so basically you have some past experience to do your risk management okay and then once this is done and the project begins well you continue the risk discovery and the monitoring of the transition indicators and the risk management and so on um, for the life of the project you know, you're you're basically kicked into your day-to-day -day ma managing of the process and of, of the of the project, and uh, as part of that day-to-day -day management, you're doing risk management as well. Just keep in mind that as you make progress in the project, as time evolves, the risk profile, which is you know what are what risks are likely, how likely they are they are, they are, um, what impact they might might have, and so on, will change over time. So. The impact of somebody leaving early in the project might be low, but it might be high once the project is three quarters of the way through, or it might be the reverse. You know, once you have your architecture in place and you're in the construction phase and everybody's just developing new new features, the risk that your uh, project manager or sorry, your your lead architect may leave um, may be low because even though the probability might be high, the the impact of that risk um, might might be less than what it might have been if that person left in the middle of the elaboration phase when the architecture was still being developed. As the project proceeds, you've got to continue to do risk management. So before the project begins, create a budget and schedule reserve and put in place your mitigation strategies. As the project is going on, keep monitoring what we call the transition indicators. And as the project is going on, once again, contain risk at every step. So proceed incrementally. Don't try to bite off too big a piece of the project at a time. Reduce the scope. This is, this is a really useful way to reduce risk because costs and risks do not grow linearly with size. If you reduce the scope, you also reduce the risk in a disproportionate manner. Prioritize released functionality so that high priority stuff is done early so that value is delivered early and hopefully before anything bad happens. By the in in the same vein, address high risk early in the project when you have time to make changes. And related to that, st start as early as you can, or at least as soon as you know enough to start. So the previous slide talked about a budget and a scheduled reserve. What are they? Basically, it's extra money in the budget to spend in case you run into a risk. What is a is that is budget reserve and uh, extra time. Uh, av available to the project to deal with any delays that might take place that is schedule reserve okay so if you have a if you have a a, a a curve that shows how much money is being spent over time so time is the x axis and money being spent is the y axis then you see a curve like that like the lower black curve then when you have the have a budget and a schedule reserve you have the the, the thinner higher curve which basically says if you need it to you could spend money at, at that rate and you could have some extra time um, to, to finish the project. And this graph uh, talks about the impact of risk mitigation on budget uh, and schedule reserves. So I hope you remember what risk mitigation it is. It is additional actions you do to reduce the probability of a risk or reduce the impact of a risk. So this is additional cost you're expending in order to reduce the risk. So you can see that um, you know, when you start doing mitigation, the cost of a project is always higher than 
um, if you don't do mitigation. But the idea is that the impact of the risk uh, will be lower and the amount you have to have as reserve in terms of budget and time will be less because you're doing these mitigation activities up front. So now that you've uh, understood sort of the principles behind risk management, um, let's take risks in software projects. Okay, so software projects have what are known, known as core risks that all software projects will have. And then they'll have risks that are specific to a particular project. So the, there are five core risks. Schedule risk, which is the project will be delayed and will not come under schedule. Um, the risk that requirements will increase. This is known as requirements creep. Um, the risk that there will be personnel turnover. The risk that the requirements are not correctly translated into specification. So the requirement didn't change, but the project team didn't quite understand it. That specification breakdown. Okay, and then finally underperformance and uh, and an incompetence on part of the team. Incidentally, these risks are somewhat in order. So in most projects, um, the risks are not lack of ability of the team or lack of commitment or motivation of the team. Even though in most projects, people will blame the project team for failure, history has shown that underperformance and incompetence are, are is the last reason why projects fail. They fail for the other four reasons. And this slide basically says the following. When you begin a software project and as you progress through it, take these core risks or what we are calling causal risks, examine the kind of project it is, add your, you know, add risks that are specific to that project. And when you put those two together, you get what are known as the aggregate risks. And these are the risks that you have to manage. We covered the learning outcomes of the course as follows. We explained that project management had multiple aspects from planning and organizing all the way through to risk management. We explained to you several project management concept and concepts and techniques, such as Gantt charts. We familiarized you with techniques for software estimation by covering linear and parametric estimation. And finally, we explained what risk management for software projects was all about.